Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Cross Points. If you are a guest or a visitor with us, we want you to know that you are always welcome here. Um, we have Pastor Hayden back with us after he had a little bit of a break, which is always exciting. He may have to reintroduce himself during the sermon, but that's okay. Um, but we're just so thankful that you're here. If you are new with us, you can learn more about uh, what it means to be a part of Crosspoint, either online or on our app, where we also have our information center across the hall. So we highly encourage you to go check that out if you want to learn more. Um, we're going to go ahead and kick things off. We're going to praise the Lord in songs. We're going to invite you at this time to stand with us. Let's sing praises.
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, 
Though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you will do. We thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of all. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We thank you, for Lord, for that promise. Thank you for the truth that is in Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you that you sustain all through him. You sustain us. You provide for our needs. You protect us. And when trouble comes, you help us through. And you help us through because of the hope that we have within us. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us to set our mind on things above to have a mindset for your kingdom and your righteousness and all these things will be added to us. Lord, we thank you for this time this morning where we can come together freely to celebrate you, to share with one another the bonds of fellowship and friendship and even deeper than that, the bond of Christ between us. We thank you for that and ask that we would live this bond out each day that we would proclaim your name among the nations, that all may know that you are God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. just wanted to make one quick announcement. Uh, I've had a couple people ask, even though there is no children's Sunday school next hour, there still will be the Acts Sunday school. And for today, we'll be meeting in the fellowship room still, but then next week we'll move back to the Awana room, since that's now empty. Thank you. And at this time, we are going to take up an offering, giving back to the Lord just a small portion of what he has blessed us with. And while that's going on, we're going to continue singing praises.
I need to introduce myself again. I'm uh, Hayden Norris. I'm the lead pastor here at Cross Point. We've been out for a couple of weeks. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 19. That's where we're going to be today. I got a couple of announcements for you, though. First of all, I want to thank uh, Gary and Kevin for preaching the last couple of weeks. We've had a, a lot of guest preachers through the month of July. We've had Walt that kicked it off on July 4th weekend. Then we had John Noyes here for our conference. And then Kevin Penner, our youth pastor, uh, not candidate anymore, but actually our youth pastor. Praise the Lord for that, right? Woohoo! Uh, they're moving right now, so you can be praying for them uh, from, from Houston to here. They'll be kind of moving uh, throughout this week. I think Kevin might be here next Sunday, so that'll be great. And then uh, Kevin and Gary alternated through some psalms. We're coming to one of my favorite, favorite psalms today. Uh, one little side note, next week will be Baptism Sunday. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Um, both services, we're hoping to have baptisms in both services. You can come to either one. I'm going to preach on the ordinance of baptism, talk about that. Um, but if you are kind of on the fence or you have told us you want to be baptized, but you haven't signed up to let us know that uh, you want to be baptized, that you have like a, a time for a video, like we need to know today. So if you're kind of like, yeah, I've told you that I'm going to be baptized, but you haven't really talked to us, talk to either Kelly, Bobby, or myself, because we need to get you set up for the video piece that we show before as you're getting into the baptism. So if you don't have a time slot and you haven't signed up for a time slot Monday and Tuesday this week, I need to know today, today, okay? You hear all that? Lots and lots of announcements. We'll take communion on the 21st of this month, and so we're kind of uh, ramping things back up for the school year. With all that said, Psalm 19, one of my favorite psalms, and we are focusing on the first book of Psalms uh, throughout this time together this summer. I think I, oh, I had this on. See, God is not silent is what I've titled it. God is not silent. There's a philosopher that said this. He said, God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. Those words were uttered by Nietzsche, who is one of the most influential philosophers of our time, uh, ever since he uttered those words, they have resonated throughout history. In 1966, Time magazine picked up the mantle and said, this is God dead on the cover of Time magazine. See, many people throughout the ages has li have lived as if God is dead. That he does not exist. Voltaire, to even today with the new 
atheism that we see in our day. So the question for us as the children of God is this, is God dead? Well, David's going to answer that question for us here in Psalm 19. Follow along as I read it to you. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork day to day, pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth, their words to the end of the world. And then he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there's nothing hidden from them. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Verse 14 says this. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Lord, I feel like we're... We're scaling Mount Everest here today. One of the Mount Everest Psalms written by David in Psalm 19. I pray that as we walk through this psalm that we'd be overwhelmed with you. That we'd be freshly amazed by you. That our hearts would be challenged by what we learned from you. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. May we walk out of this place today with that reality in our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's the big idea for today. It's this. God is not dead. He still speaks today. God is not dead. He still speaks today. Amen? We're a little out of practice. We'll get with it today. (laughs) He still speaks today. That's what David wants us to know from Psalm 19. This psalm reminds us of the fact that, that God is speaking to us. And there's some specific ways that it speaks, that, that the psalm speaks of God speaking to us. And the first one is this. It's easy to see he speaks through creation the first part of this psalm uh, verses one through six talks about that it starts with verse one it says this the heavens declare the glory of god the 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 word declare could be translated are telling the heavens are talking are speaking of the glory of god the heavens the in scripture when you see the word heaven uh, it, could re- it could be speaking of one of three things. It could be speaking of the sky above us, or it could be speaking of outer space, or it could be speaking of the place where God resides. And which one is it here? I think it's all. All of it is declaring the glory of God. Recounting, rehearsing, declaring is how this can be translated. Continuously. He doesn't say the heavens declared. He doesn't say the heavens will declare. He says they are declaring the glory of God. Psalm 9.1 uses this type of language. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. Same word. I will declare your wonderful deeds. The heavens are doing that. They're declaring God's wonderful deeds. 
Psalm 26, 7, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. The heavens are telling the wondrous deeds of God. So what are they saying? What are the heavens saying? They're saying this, God is glorious. That's what they're saying. The glory of God. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers, says this, he who looks up to the heavens and then writes himself down as an atheist brands himself at the same moment an idiot or a liar. He doesn't mince words, does he? And if you look at this psalm, it says the, the, the skies, the heavens proclaim. It says this, day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. Their voice is heard over and over and over again. The psalmist wants us to know that. David wants us to know that. See, God speaks to us today in creation. John Calvin says this, If indeed we are attentive as we ought to be, even one day would suffice to bear testimony to us of the glory of God. Even one night would be sufficient. See, God speaks continuously, daily, nightly, openly, gloriously. Crosspoint, the question for you is this, are you listening? Are you listening to what God is saying through his creation? Day and night, creation speaks. The, the word for speaks is pours out, literally belches or bubbles out God's glory. All of creation testifies to the glory of its creator. Amen? All of it. I don't know if you're aware of this, but recently they put up a new telescope and some amazing images have come back. Here's one of them. Isn't that pretty cool? Do you know what that's saying? God is glorious. God is glorious. You know what that waterfall's saying? God is glorious. You know what that bird's saying? Help me out here. No, I was going for cheap, cheap. That's what <laughs> birds say. But I guess you can interpret it as God is glorious, right? All creation with one voice says God is glorious. All of it. Heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun. We'll get on to that part in a minute. What is David trying to show us? That God's testimony through his creation is everywhere. It's inescapable. You can't escape it. I could name creature after creature after creature after creature in creation that testify to the glory of God. Look up the bombardier beetle. Little bug. Look up the archer fish. Some of you guys are really good shooting a rifle, the archer fish is better than any of us. Amazing creation. And all of it testifies to the glory of the creator. Verse 5, he, he brings in another piece. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber like a strong man, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens. Its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from his he, well, he brings in what? He brings in the sun. Now, why would he bring in the sun? After he just talked about creation, why does he focus in on the sun? Well, if you look at history, ancient history, many of the cultures worship the sun in many ways. The Egyptians, the Romans, the Aztecs all worship the sun. And so he's saying that this, this big sphere in the sky, this thing that you're worshiping, is under God's control. 
He wants to make sure that we understand the biggest thing that we can think of, the, the, the thing in the sky that brings us light, yeah, God tells that where to go and when to go and how to go. God's completely in control. And he uses these images of, of strength and joy and youth, talking about like a, a marriage feast. And he wants us to picture the sunrise. And he says this, every time you see the sun rise and the sun set, remember that God controls it. All of it. See, all creation is openly and constantly speaking about how glorious God is. Amen? Let's try that again. Uh, all creation is constantly speaking about how glorious God is. All right. Everywhere you go, it's speaking to the glory of God. So the question for us is how come we don't hear it? Now, this isn't some call for you to go out camping and ground yourself in creation, although that might be something you might like to do. This isn't like a speech about getting back to nature. That's not what I'm after. It's this. It's a call to open your eyes and ears and listen to what creation is testifying to. Nature, art, creativity, sport. You know, on my break, I got, had a chance to go to a concert. Tuesday in Kansas City, we were in Kansas City, um, it was a very different concert. Maverick City Worship was there with Kirk Franklin. The different background and different in everything. And you know what? I walked out of there, and we walked out four hours into it, and it was still going. <laughs> it was a long concert. It was the longest concert I've ever been to. And there's this time where uh, there was a stage up front, and they brought some benches out, and just the artist sat down and just sang some songs. I didn't know most of the songs because they were from a different tradition. They were from the African-American church in our country. And I just thought to myself, the creativity that was demonstrated just in that one concert, I was like blown away. I'm, I'm not a weeper. I'm not a, a, a guy that's really emotional in that way. And I wept at a concert. Because it was testifying to the glory of God. There's this song that, that, that they sing that just resonates in my mind. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. And it goes over and over again. And sometimes I don't love songs that repeat, but it, they don't really repeat this. They kind of add to it over and over and again. It was an amazing song. Because it reminded me of God's glory over and over and over again. Give yourself some space every day, whether it be a song on the radio, whether it be sporting events. Maybe you could see the glory of God in sport. I, I see it all the time. I'm amazed. Maybe it's going out, walking around a lake. Give yourself some space each day to hear the testimony of creation that God is glorious. But that's not all in this psalm. Not only does he speak through creation, he speaks through the word of God. Spurgeon goes on to say this in his commentary in Psalm 19. He is wisest who reads both the world book and the word book as two volumes of the same work and feels concerning both of them my father wrote them both do you understand what he's saying he's saying you can read the world and say God is glorious but you need to read the word and see that God is glorious verses 1 through 6 theologians often call General revelation, the testimony of creation to God's glory. 
Verses 7 through 11, they, they term special revelation. I just want you to think through this. If God did not reveal himself to us, we would not know him. And he reveals himself most clearly to us through the word of God. Through what you have stated, many of you in paper form on your lap or in electronic form, or you hear it read to you. We would not know about God if he didn't tell us who he is. We would know some things about him. Creation testifies to his greatness, and that's enough to judge us for all of our sinfulness, but it, we wouldn't know him if he didn't specifically reveal himself to us. And he does through the word of God. Now, how do you break this, this part up? It's really, really heavy, okay? And so I want you to kind of write these down. There's, there's, there's six synonyms, six adjectives, and six actions. What do I mean by that? Well, well the six synonyms for the Bible, these are words that are very similar to the Bible. The six synonyms are law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, and judgments. If you didn't get them, they're right there in front of you. They begin every one of them, right? The law, the testimony. Why does he use these synonyms? Because it's going to tell us something about the Word of God differently through each of them. Then there are six adjectives for the Bible right after that. He describes what these are. And those are perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. You see the pattern? There's six synonyms for the Bible, then there's six adjectives, and then there are six actions that spring from that. And they are this, reviving, making wise, rejoicing, enlightening, enduring, and righteous. So let's go through them. Now, this is not a deep dive, and if you want word studies on these, you can do that on your own. But I want to kind of give you a, a general feeling of what he's trying to tell us. Because remember, the Psalms aren't like the letters in the New Testament where you drill down on every single word. They're songs that were sung, and they're very emotive. So what's he trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us the Word of God is glorious. That's what he's trying to tell us. And so how does he do that? Well, verse 7, let's start with this. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The law, the word law, Torah, the right and wrongness, how we know what is right and what is wrong. That's what he's focusing on, the, the fact that the Bible tells us right and wrong. He says that is perfect. That means it's complete. It's blameless. And it restores our soul. It refreshes and revives us. You ever think of that? A lot of times we think of the right and wrong in the Bible and we're like, oh, that's constrictive. That's not helpful. But that's not what the psalmist says. He says, actually, the law revives our soul. It keeps us in the guardrails so that we don't go off the cliff. The Bible can revive, restore, and transform you because it's perfect in every way. That's where he starts. And then he goes on in verse 7b, keep reading. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. Testimony, that word is the warning or corrob you know, um, corrob uh, correcting aspect. The testimony is sure. It is established. It is confirmed. It is reliable. Meaning the word of God is reliable and everything it testifies to. And then he says, making wise the simple. We are made wise by the word. Think about this. The Bible takes our simple minds and gives us a framework to frame the world. It gives us a framework to frame the world. Have you ever gotten angry by somebody who, who rejects the word of God and you're like, I don't understand why they don't see it. It's because they don't have the framework that you have. Given by the word of God through the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart, you frame things differently because God has done that in your heart. So don't get mad. Pray and tell them about God. You're like, I, I don't understand how the world has gone this way. I do. The Bible has told us it was going to go this way. It was going to go from bad to worse. 
You're like, well, why is it going from bad to worse? Because the Bible told us it would go from bad to worse. And guess what? It's reliable. It's true. Verse 8, he says this, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Precepts, that word precepts is divine guidelines or codes of conduct. They're right. That means those, those precepts are straight. They're level. They're just. Rejoicing the heart. That's the opposite of what people think of the Bible. People say, oh man, you're going to go by those list of rules. That's so oppressive. And yet, the psalmist says, it makes our hearts rejoice. See, when God tells you don't do something, he's saying, don't hurt yourself. I know what's best for you. The Bible brings joy to us when we follow its commands. It's the opposite of what the culture says. And then he says this in verse 8b, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandment, not suggestions, but commands. And there are a lot of them in the Bible. And those are pure. They're without blemish. They're clear. A lot of times we want to skirt around the clear commandments of the Word of God because we don't understand something that's unclear. And most of us think that we don't understand they're not commands. They're like minute details. Mark Twain, who, who was no lover of the word, said this, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. I mean, how true is that? But the commandments are pure. They enlighten our eyes. They open our eyes. The Bible gives us true light in the darkness. Verse 9, it says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Fear, not meaning terror in the corner, but this focus on awe and worship and humility. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's morally, it's ethically good, enduring forever. It stands strong forever. The Bible is right today. It'll be right tomorrow. It'll be right forever. Amen? It's always right. Like, what about this? Doesn't this change? No, it's always right. We get it wrong. But the word's never wrong. We may apply it wrongly, but the word's never wrong. It's never wrong. Verse 9, it says this as well. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The rules, the decisions, the verdicts are true, they're reliable, they're stable, and they're always the right. right. Here's the point he wants you to get. God's revelation through this book that you can buy pretty much anywhere nowadays. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it in, 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 at Walmart even. This book is always true. Here's the question for you. How do you view the Word of God? Do you sit in judgment and stand over the Word of God? Or do you see the Word of God as the Word of God and put yourself under the Word of God? You know, we can get so focused in all the ills of our world. And we can get in all these fights about this and that and this and that. It always boils down to this. How do you view the Word of God? Are you under it or you're standing in judgment over it? Because if you can get to that point with someone, you can start to talk. Because all that other stuff doesn't matter. It's how you view the Word of God and what He has said to you. Are you going to submit yourself to the Word of God? Nancy Guthrie has written a phenomenal resource for you. It's called Praying the Bible for Your Children. It's a 365-day devotional. If you're looking for a devotional, it's wonderful. I've used it. Heather's used it. In that... As I was kind of prepping for this, she took Psalm 19, this section we just went through, and made it into prayers. It's pretty cool. Here's one of them. I'm going to use my kids. They're not here in this service, but they'll be in second service. Here's how she took these words and actually applied them. Lord, 
and I'm going to put my oldest son in here. May Ben put his full trust in what you decree for his life. May Ben be wise as he trusts you with the truths he knows. Or how about this, Lord, while the world around Susanna tells her lies, give her ears to listen to you. Or Lord, Adrian needs insight that comes only from you to make his way through life. May your word rest in his heart. Do you see how she took those little phrases and made them prayers for her children? It's a great way to use the word of God. If you need a resource or a devotional, it's one page every day, prayers for your children. It's called Praying the Bible, 365-day devotional. Nancy Guthrie wrote it. I don't get any kickbacks from it, so I don't get anything, okay? I don't even know Nancy. Great resource, though. So what's the psalmist trying to tell us here today? He speaks through creation and the word. So the question for us is this. Why so often do we not hear him? Why don't we hear God? Why does the world seem so much louder? Why? Well, here's why. Number three. We hear God by humbling ourselves. This is where the rubber meets the road. Because I think I get you all to say amen about creation. I get you to say amen about the Word of God. What about humbling ourselves under the Word of God? Because that's where he's going right here. Look at verse 10. More to be desired, talking about the Word of God, are they than gold, than even much fine gold, sweeter than honey, drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them is great reward. You're saying, that's humil- humility? Yeah. This word of God that's so easily available that I have on my phone, I have the, many copies of this, is more precious than gold and honey from the honeycombs. Is that how you view it? i got to be honest, sometimes I don't view it that way. And why is that? Because I'm proud. I don't want to do what it has to say to me sometimes. To see God's word as precious, sweet, and valuable, we must humble ourselves. We have more access to the Bible than any other people in the world. And let me be frank and honest because I love to be honest in church. We are more ignorant of the Bible than we've ever been in our culture. But we have more access than anyone has ever had. So it's not an information problem. It's a problem of humility. Humbling ourselves under the word of God. John Bunyan is famous for saying this about the Bible. He said this, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. One of two. Verse 12, he he picks it up, he says this, this is all humility. When you you see this through the lens of humility, you, you understand why this, look, I don't even know myself like you know me, God. I can't even discern what's going on in my heart, but your word can. You can. That's humility. Then verse 13, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. He's saying, keep me from things that I don't even know I'm doing or wrong. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Here's something you need to settle in your mind today. The Bible tells you truth about you because it God knows you. It's always true. When it cuts your heart, you're like, man, I wish that wasn't in the Bible. It's probably an area that you need to work through. It's always true. And then he says this, these, these phrases that maybe we should all speak before we leave our house every day. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock. And Redeemer. He's saying, look, God, I want to speak words that praise your name to everyone I meet. He's saying this, look, God, I'm a sinner. 
And that's why I don't hear you. I need you. See, we have a lot more insight than even David did at this point when he wrote this psalm. Because we're standing on the other side of the cross of Jesus Christ. Our great Savior, who God made him, Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We exchange our sinfulness for Christ's righteousness. when We trust in his sacrifice alone. He lived the perfect life, died to death that we deserve, and rose in victory over our sin. That's humbling. God didn't say, you know, hey, uh, you're kind of good. Just kind of fix up a couple of these things on your own. You'll be good to go. He said, we're completely wicked in our hearts. The judgment on us from the word of God isn't pretty. And we are hopeless without a savior. But we have to humble ourselves and say, look, I'm a sinner. I need saving. Otherwise, who needs a savior if you got it all figured out on your own? Jesus died so that we can truly live. One of the benefits for me being able to go on some vacation is I get to go to different churches. And I went to a church in Kansas City area called Liberty uh, Christian Fellowship. And the pastor said this. It really stuck with me. I, I love this. I think it's a great phrase. He said this. We don't love and obey God so that he will be kind to us. But we love and obey him because he is kind to us. He's like, it's not an if, but a because. It's not God will be kind to me if I do these things, but God is kind to me because of who he is. It's not, can I do enough, but Jesus is enough. I want to stand before you, cross point, with all surety of this fact that God is not dead. He still speaks today through creation and through his word. The question for you is this, are you going to humble yourself so that you can hear him? Let's pray. God, great is your faithfulness to me in more ways than I can recount. You are so patient and kind with us. Lord, I pray that we would humble ourselves. We would humble ourselves Knowing that when we do that, though we might be vulnerable, we are strong when we are humble around your word. Lord, I pray if there is anyone here who does not know you as their Savior, that today would be the day that they would uh, uh, grab one of our ushers or me or someone else from the band and, and just ask them, you know, what is this faithfulness you're talking about? And we would tell them the truth about who you are. Lord, we, we want to be people who love you and show that love to others. Lord, we need your strength here today to put this into practice, to hear you speak through your word and through creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with this church. Let's praise that great name of Jesus. i
Um, good morning. I'm Marilyn Buznitz, Children's Ministries Director, and I get to share a few announcements with you at the end of our morning here. Welcome. Glad you're here. Um, we are needing some volunteers for our Sunday school classes that will start up in September. September 11th is our first Sunday of, of our regular Sunday school classes. And so we need some teachers in that area, and we need some um, nursery workers, especially maybe first service, some subs would be really nice in there. Um, so if that's something that you are, are interested in doing, let me know. Um, our Awana volunteers is something else that we need. Uh, our Awana registration is now open. You can register your kiddos for Awana. Um, and with that comes the need for our volunteers. We have some specific things that we need. Uh, Cubby's director, uh, TNT uh, game leader, but other than that, we just need people that are willing to come and help kids understand Scripture and help them um, help memorize Scripture. So that's really what we do on, on Wednesday nights. That's our Wednesday night program here. Um, let's see. What else do we have going? Oh, celebrate Crosspoint. We, we sent a save the date, um, and that is the 28th of August. It's a Sunday in the evening. A lot of times we have done this on a Wednesday. We're switching it to a Sunday night. So we're going to celebrate Crosspoint, everything that we have done throughout this last year. And if you look backwards, there's a lot. We actually did that a little bit this week, and it's amazing. So we want to celebrate that and then kick off into our next year all at the same time. So there will be food and fun and fellowship and inflatables and just a good time for everybody on that night. So make sure you have that on your calendar. Um, let's see. Did we not do a slide for the missions? You're okay, talking. I'm going to talk about the missions anyway. Um, our, there, some of our youth went to Chicago, and so next Sunday on the 14th, right after second service, the youth are going to be giving kind of a little thought of what happened there, what the Lord was doing there, some, and if you would like to hear everything that went on there and how the Lord worked in the lives of our youth and in other people in Chicago, um, come after second service and uh, join them, and they would be glad to share those things with you. And let's see what else is there. Oh, we have our, our youth pastor coming. Yeah. And so he will start <laughs> oh, yeah. on, the, on the 15th, which is next Monday, and um, he will be here maybe on Sunday. You might see his face a little bit, but he will officially start on Monday. And so he will be hitting the ground running, and so for all of you youth and youth parents he will be getting information and communication out to you guys just as soon as possible so that you will know what's happening for this next year. Yep. We're excited about that. Kevin will be we here. Kevin's in the midst of moving. The movers showed up one day, and it was raining. They showed up the next day. It was raining. So I think they moved today. They actually got things loaded today. So they'll be up here this week. I want to remind you of these words from 1 Corinthians. It's kind of our words for the road, our benediction. He says this, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not sleep, but all will be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on the immortality. And he says this, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? God's point, you're loved. You're loved by God. You're loved by us here at Cross Point. Go love your neighbors as yourselves. You're dismissed.